So today we have James Zuccolo from the EPI, the Education Policy Institute in the United Kingdom, coming to have a, a chat with us. James is Director for School Workforce of the EPI, and so I'll I'll ask him soon exactly what that is and the such. That'll be good fun. But he's also, more importantly to my mind, a former major contributor and founder to the Visible Hand Economics blog. Uh, he's a good friend of mine. We have a lot of fun talking about economics. So I just have pestered him to join me after work today to just have a yarn about education things because I realized after posting about education, I know absolutely nothing about it. So glad to see you, James. How's it going? It's fantastic to be here, Matt, this morning or this evening, depending on where you are, what part of the world you're in. Thank you so much for getting up so early to uh, have me on your podcast. Oh, well, I love being up early. I, I had um had work to do anyway, so it's always good fun. So so just to start off, could you could you tell me exactly what uh director for school workforce means and sort of what sort of education things you're you're into nowadays? Yeah, well, these days I'm at the Education Policy Institute, which is a small independent research institute based in London in the UK and really focused on education in England and improving opportunities for children, particularly the most disadvantaged children in England and helping to close that gap with the attainment of the more affluent children. And we're a bunch of uh, 20 or 25 statisticians and economists uh, sitting around poking at big administrative data sets in a basement there. Um, and then writing reports and trying to persuade the government. So the stuff I do is about the teaching workforce for the most part. And what we're really focused on there is trying to improve the quality of the teaching workforce in England, because there's really nothing more important for pupils than the quality of teaching that they receive. Um, and in England, what's going on at the moment is that there are far too few teachers because so many are quitting the profession at the moment and they're really struggling to recruit enough teachers to join and replace those that are leaving, particularly in subjects like physics, maths, chemistry, all these STEM subjects where if you're, say, a, a physics graduate, you can go to the City of London, which is one of the world's big financial hubs, and earn vast amounts of money. So it's really difficult for a school nearby um, who's only paying you know, a standard teacher salary to hang on to those teachers. So we talk a lot about how you could tweak pay and tweak the reward systems in schools to try to hang on to those people as well. So uh, that's most of what I'm doing. The most recent thing we published, if I can ramble for another 30 seconds. Hell yeah, definitely. Uh, the most recent thing we did is we tried to look at uh, how good head teachers are and whether that has much of an impact for hanging on to the teachers you have. Because, I mean, we all know that we've had great managers in our lives and managers who've maybe struggled a little bit more to motivate, uh, motivate us and the rest of their staff. And it's probably nothing more important in one's working life than your relationship with your manager, how good they are, how much they motivate you, how much you, they make you care about your job and what you're doing. Um, and so I think it's the same for teachers and for head teachers. So we try to look at the value added of head teachers and ask whether teachers, head teachers that are um, really high value added on uh, pupil attainment. So they join a school, they're leading it and the pupils do really great, better than they would have perhaps under another head teacher. Are those the same sorts of head teachers that, really hang on to their staff um, because a lot of people say, well, if you're terrible, then all your staff will quit. So we're trying to look at these correlations in the, um, in the UK admin data. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. The, the whole idea that there's lots of teachers sort of making a move on because the opportunity cost associated with staying in teaching compared to another profession is quite high as rising is, is pretty, pretty interesting. I think relevant to a, a lot of countries do you think it's more of an issue in the United Kingdom, given the the productivity slowdown or changes in the distribution of income or some such? Well, that's a really interesting question. Now, I haven't really thought about that, to be honest, like what these macro factors are. I think what we know for sure is that when there are uh, income shocks across the private economy, 
that has really big effects for public sector workers as well. So if you look at um, after the financial crisis in 2008, a whole lot of people joined teaching. Um, I don't know so much about the other public sector workforces, but they certainly did join teaching. And you've got really great people coming into teaching as well. There's been some studies of this, that these people who came into teaching straight after the financial crisis, particularly in places that have big financial hubs, places like the US and the UK, um, they they were really outstanding teachers and they left at a greater rate once the fun income shock of the financial crisis passed and other opportunities became more available to them. But still quite a few of them stuck around and they tended to be better teachers than um, the teachers who would otherwise have been there. So I think there's pretty good evidence that these macro shocks, which the public sector is quite insulated from because um, the government doesn't tend to adjust wages or lay off a lot of staff in response to falling tax revenues. I mean, obviously they're concerned about the automatic stabilizers um, and making sure that teachers and public sector workers continue to be employed is a part of that as well. Um, so the, the Joe's jobs tend to be incredibly secure through uh, financial troubles and through COVID recently as well. So a lot of people came into teaching during COVID and, and you know, probably some really talented people too uh, because of the fall in job security in other parts of the economy, even though we had a furlough scheme here. I don't know what it was like in Australia, but a scheme which tried to support jobs even as revenues for firms dropped. Yeah, yeah. There was, there was furlough malarkey over here and in New Zealand as well. I say malarkey, but actually they were pretty pretty effective schemes that that cut to the cause of a lot of what was going on during COVID. So I shouldn't be too rude. And I was in policy circles at the time, sort of a big fan of them. But when we when we think about that, you know, those job retention schemes were trying to avoid mobility. But a lot of what you've described really touches on this idea that mobility is important, especially when we think about barriers to entry in terms of entering teaching and exiting teaching. Uh, I'm hearing a lot about these people being able to enter who were, ended up being quite high quality and then leaving. Now, when I look at Australia and New Zealand, I see increasing accreditation for the need to actually be involved in teaching, the requirement for different standards to do teaching at not just a primary and secondary level, but also tertiary. And, you know, these types of occupational licensing, almost regimes, have value in terms of making sure a minimum standard is met. But do those types of things exist in the United Kingdom? And, and do you have any idea if they're pushing against the mobility that you're talking about as being quite important? I think that's a really interesting question. And one that, where I think that some economics public uh, authors in education have a really different view from educationalists who are non-economists. So if you talk to educationalists who are not economists, but they've spent their lives as say teachers and then doing teacher development, they'll say that what the teaching profession needs to become a real profession, not just a bunch of people doing a job, but a profession in the way that say, um, being an orthopedic surgeon is a profession, you have a professional body. There are expectations that you maintain your skills, that you develop your skills, that you work with a larger community to make sure that um, you're all achieving a high standard and developing your shared knowledge about how to do the job better. And they'll say that is essential for teachers to improve and that we don't have that at the moment in teaching. But the way to do that, to get that, is to say, look, everyone needs to achieve some minimum standard, not just of teaching proficiency, but also um, an ability to reflect upon their work and to do what they would call research, which isn't necessarily what an economist would think of as research, but sort of to test things themselves, to understand what's coming out in the educational literature when they're reading summaries of it and then apply that in their own practice. So they're always improving and working with colleagues to do so. Whereas if you look at what economists say, they'll often say it's impossible to know who will be a good teacher by looking at observable characteristics before they've started teaching. So if you look at their grades at university or their grades at school or um, other personality characteristics. These are extremely poor predictors of how effective they will be as a teacher if they enter teaching. So what some of those economists will say is what you need to do is bring down the barriers to entry, allow more people to try it. But then, of course, 
be um, be uh, more effective with your people management to make sure that people who aren't succeeding at the profession um, on the job move on quite quickly and find something that's more suitable for them. And I don't think there's a lot of research that really brings these perspectives together. There aren't a lot of economists I read who try to really understand what the benefits of that human capital accumulation as a community and as individuals might look like and whether that would outweigh the benefits of getting in more talented people early on or who really address the, um, the likely consequences for staff motivation of having a much more brutal regime um, early on in a teacher's career. So in the UK, there is a uh, you do have to get qualified teacher status, they call it, which normally only going to take you a year or two to get. So you could do a bit of a university course. Or there's a bunch of ways to get it, but maybe you do a one-year postgraduate diploma and then uh, you go train in a school for a little bit and you get a qualified teacher status. And so what they did in the UK is the, the last government, well, a couple of governments ago, they were a bit persuaded, I think, by these economists that you needed to reduce barriers to entry. And they said, we're going to create a new sort of school, um, a little bit like charter schools in the US. They're called academy schools here. And they don't have to only employ people who have qualified teacher status. They could employ anyone. So if you see experts around who you think should be teaching the children, then you can employ them as teachers, even if they don't have qualified teacher status. That's been in place for over a decade now, and it is still extremely rare to see uh, people who are not, are not qualified teachers and are not working towards being qualified teachers teaching those schools. So those schools, those academy schools, they're now well over half of all schools in England, and yet it's very rare they don't hire qualified teachers. So there's certainly a, a, a cultural opposition among teachers to having those barriers to entry come down. They seem to really value those qualifications, perhaps just because it gives some information about the amount of training those teachers have had, a bit of a shorthand, so they don't have to do so much assessment themselves. But yeah, I'm curious to hear your thoughts, Matt, about this. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's that's really fascinating. And, uh, you know, you've, you've covered so much interesting ground there. The, the one other thing that comes to mind that I'd be interested in your thoughts on is there are underlying information asymmetries about sort of parents knowing the quality of a teacher and also being able to evaluate even ex post the quality of a teacher per se, because it's so hard to separate that from student fixed effects and, and environmental things that are happening at the time. And, and both of those can be reasons why an occupational licensing regime can be justified even in the economics literature. Um, and, and and But the fact that you found this revealed outcome that the the teachers that joined when there was an economic shock were, appeared to be very high quality, showed the importance of mobility, which, which you know, there are these competing trade-offs and they appear to both be potentially large trade-offs. So understanding their quantum and, and how they interact is important. Um, so to, yeah, does... Sure. Oh, sorry. Does it does that sort of set of factors does that come to mind to you a lot? And is that is that an important part of the the type of work you're looking at? Yeah, I think it's an interesting question. This observability. Um, on the one hand, intuitively, experts in any skill tend to think that they can assess the expertise of other people at performing that skill. So, head teachers and experienced teachers think they can observe the quality of other teachers. And to an extent, that is true. But when we talk about um, in the economics literature, oh, this person is uh, better and we mean high value added and we mean perhaps some teacher fixed effect we're talking about there. And we're looking at maybe a, a standard deviation or variance in those teacher fixed effects to ask, well, what is the difference in teaching quality? Um, a lot of these effect sizes are really small on average. So if you look at the difference between a teacher who is uh, sort of brand new to teaching and then someone who's got five or 10 years of experience, you're looking at an effect size of probably about point, point 0.2 standard deviations or so. And that's not really big enough to be easily visible to the naked eye. You know, if you looked at two populations, which were only point 0.2 SD apart on average, and you took small sample draws 
from those as you would if you were observing teachers in the classroom. It would be very difficult to discern you know, uh, from that noisy data where, you know, did they have an off day? Did they have a good day when you were teaching them? Was the class behaving poorly? Was it behaving well? Were they teaching in their usual subject or maybe they had to cover a lesson that wasn't their normal subject? You know, separating out the differences in quality from all that noise um, with small effect sizes is exceptionally difficult. So I think the question about observability is a, a really, really good one. Often when we're thinking about um, in aggregate how we improve the quality of teaching, that's not really the same thing that we're talking about um, that people are looking at on the ground when head teachers are making judgments about teachers. Or it's not clear that it is the same quality we're observing. Often they're observing things that uh, we can't measure. Um, intangible things in the data, uh, maybe things like um, how on task are the students, how quiet does the classroom seem, how good is behaviour in the classroom, and how in control of the classroom does that teacher seem when you drop in. And those things are not necessarily highly correlated with pupil attainment. And so what they're observing there may be a bit different from what we're measuring in the aggregate data. I don't feel like I've answered your question here, sorry, but I probably rambled long enough mm -hmm. about that. No, no, that's that's definitely definitely relevant. I was just wondering how to square the idea that uh, sort of teacher value add is similar across teachers with the idea that there are, you know, if we rewarded teachers that were high performing, that would lead to better outcomes. Um, I can think of implicitly some ways to square it, but I'm much more interested in, in how you would square that. Well, you're probably going to tie me in knots here, as you typically do. But I think um, across education, effect sizes are very small. If you find an intervention that has an effect size of more than 0 0.15, 0 0.2, I think everyone will look at you askance, really. Um, but uh, small differences in pupils' performance have a really big impact on their wage outcomes. So if you can improve a pupil's um, grades when they're 15, by, I don't know, like 0.1 standard deviations, which I think if you looked at sort of charts would say that's a really small effect. Um, that could be 10, 15,000 pounds of extra MPV onto their lifetime earnings right there, just to get an extra half a grade or something um, at age 15 exams. So I think it's mostly because small differences in attainment typically lead to quite big differences in lifetime earnings. Interesting, interesting. No, that's that's definitely relevant. The the other related factor I think that supports your point is that you know introducing a pricing mechanism where teacher efforts important could in turn you know lead to the the overall value of teacher quality increasing because they have this incentive to put in more effort. Now I'm just talking as someone who likes to talk and has no idea about the evidence. It, have you found any evidence in that sort of direction? There's a very mixed, very mixed evidence on performance-related pay among teaching. It's a really contentious topic. Uh, actually, the government in England has just said it's getting rid of the requirement for schools to do um, performance assessments and based pay on performance assessments. So a decade ago, the government in England said, the problem with teaching pay is that every year you just get an extra tick up on the pay spine. And that doesn't incentivize effort, but it also means that if you think you're a high performer, you're not going to get any additional um, more rapid pay increases. And so you're not going to attract high performers or hold on to them to the extent that we would like. So it said all schools have to base pay rises now on performance. You can assess it however you want, but you have to base it on performance. And so 90% of schools actually did change the way they did pay i mean like I mean, they all had to change their policy but if you look at the way pay progression happened in those schools uh all teachers did not get the same bump each year after this in 90 percent of schools so it did change but maybe surprisingly um there wasn't any obvious impact on pupil retention because of that uh i think it's a little unclear why um the researchers who worked on that, and, and I am going to mangle what they said now, but that they believe this was something to do with schools having local labour market monopsony power because um, because teachers are quite immobile often. If they have uh, children of their own, which often they will, who are at a local school, and there are not many local schools, um, then they will be quite 
geographically immobile. So unless they're in very large centers, like say London or Birmingham, which are very big cities here of millions of people, um, but the rest of the country, you know, is much uh, smaller, then um, those schools have a monopsony power. And so because of that, they say, well, it doesn't really affect retention. Um, but I don't remember the details of what they found. I should go back and look at that really interesting paper. Um, overseas, there have been really mixed results on this. In Israel, uh, Victor Levy has always found that performance pay has enormous impact on pupil outcomes and improves them dramatically. In the US, Roland Fryer looked at incentives for teachers and found they had no impact whatsoever. Um, so I think the specific design of the scheme is really important. And I can't tell you off the top of my head what features of the schemes seem to be most important. But there's certainly no one sort of, oh, if you give teachers incentives, it necessarily improves pupil performance or teacher retention, which I think in many cases you would expect to see. Interesting. Yeah, no, that's that's really fascinating. Zoom's just telling me that we're pretty much out of time. So, and that's probably for the best because otherwise we we don't stop chatting. But we should definitely have another one of these chats sometime soon. And I also realized that I, I suggested a topic and we have not talked about that at all because you got me so excited about the stuff you're doing. So, so that's great. So, um, so much for having me on there. It's all good. Did you have any, any final thoughts you want to, to drop in before we. I'll save them for next time. Awesome. Love it. Well, thank you very much, James. I'll see you later.